Morning everybody, welcome to Juma Game Reserve this morning. My name is Mark, Seb is with me on camera, and Tara is in final control. Beautiful morning, very still, and very unusual. Well, no, it's not. I'm on drive, which means a little bit of cloud in the sky. It's quite weird cloud, we'll get back out onto the open air. I just thought we'd open up <clears throat> in a really different spot for a change. It's a view we don't often have, although it's very hazy, it's not very clear, and it's still quite grey and dull. There's very thick cloud in the east, there's very, there's very thick cloud in the south and to the southwest. Some amazing s rays of cloud coming over as the sun is rising and painting the colours of it. But that's looking out towards Rebecca's Road. Some knob thorns. Now that big green one that is straight ahead of us. I'm morning here from so far nothing. Something making a noise here. Yeah. At the moment I'm down at Solomon's dip. Okay, copy. Okay, copy. So I just don't know if I have to start from the beginning again. It can be a little bit disheartening sometimes when we really have a wonderful start to morning and then we find out that we've got to start all over again because of the lagging behind. Franklin though making a really determined alarm call here. So welcome back everybody. <coughs> Maybe nothing. There's a Franklin feeding quite peacefully here. Maybe further back towards the road. That was worth a try. A lot of hyena tracks. There's a lot of elephant on filament zip and buffalo. See something? Uh. One of the guy ropes come off.
Very sticky this morning. Kind of humid. A little humid. Just a very slight chill. <clears throat> Nice angle on the sausage tree, it's getting full now, it's, look how dense it is, the leaves have come out to shade those flowers, one of the flowers underneath the crown, in fact there are probably a few flowers that have been pollinated already, and Lynn, I will get a photo, not nice now, but somehow I'll try and get a photo later maybe if there's sunshine, I'm sure the sun will come out again today normally burns things open later in the day, later in the morning. There are a few birds in there, probably starlings. The starlings are the cheats because they tear open the flowers to get, and the, the bulbuls as well, to get to the nectar at the base that the, only the sunbirds are supposed to get to. Hello bee, I've got a bee in the cab with me. Come sit on my hand. Here's some water. Bee. Who's that? A barbet. Crested barbet. Also, cheating. A lot of those flowers will be eaten by all sorts of antelope as well. Of course, that's only after they fall off of the tree. I don't know if it could be rain. There are ants that are showing signs of change. Um, it's not the kind of cloud that we've been having that burns away by mid-morning. Um, very, very high cloud. Also two layers, which does sometimes indicate rain. Um, who knows what's coming up from the south, we'll have to keep an eye on it. saying and also it's getting cold in England already. Well, I've been listening. <coughs> well I've heard of some temperatures getting down into the 40s and things already. In other in parts of the northern hemisphere it can't be can't be too pleasant but it's not winter yet so it's still autumn it might still have a bit of warm weather going into October. Sleeping 
buffalo is live. I left it all went west, yeah. So Linda was asking, morning Linda. Welcome. Linda was asking, are hyenas in the canine family? No, Linda. The hyenas are in the hyena family. But if you're looking at the branches of a tree in terms of where they fit in the family tree of the carnivores, there's a marula tree, let's use that as an example. Let's take the marula tree as, and this is just a very basic, but if you take this marula tree as an example, and the main trunk of the cana, the, the, cana, the carnivores, that first fork, let's say, that would be where the dogs branch off, the canidae. And then the second fork, you take the main one. And then, you see there's that little branch that goes off again? You could say, after the dogs break off and the rest of the cats and their families, then underneath that you get another branch that goes off way on its own, and that would be the hyenas. And then another branch would be the viverids, which are the mongoose and the genets and the civets. And then another branch, which would be the cats. So the, the, I guess what I'm saying is the hyenas essentially would trace back to cat family more than dog family. Well, not trace back to, but are linked closer to. They have feline genes more than they have canine genes. But all of them have, there's a bacteria, all of them have, are, are from the order of carnivores, but carnivora. Oh, Bat, what you up to? Should I say hello, Bat, what you at? Bat, uh, sitting in the tree. So there sitting in a tree sometimes means something, but on a day like today, not necessarily. Overcast. It's pretty still, there are no thermals, and a bird like that that lives or spends most of its most of its time in the air, a battle needs thermals, it needs those warm updrafts or at least air movement. It's a little bit too much energy consumptive having to flap its wings all the time. So it might not mean anything. Now Bacteria is essentially a snake eagle. What we term the snake eagles and they are set apart from say the true eagles in that the true eagles have got feathered legs all the way down to the feet and the snake eagles are feathered well, they, they scaled legs, they've got bare legs. Supposedly, to help them dive into the grasses after the very small prey, as opposed to the other eagles that have much larger prey, but also to give them a fair amount of protection against being bitten by their very prey items. The snakes, not necessarily only snakes, but of all the snake eagles, the bateleer is the only one that really scavenges. It's one of the lowest flying eagles. In fact, I think the only eagle that hunts lower than a bateleer is the elephants. There's the bateleer flying. Speak to the devil. The only person, or rather eagle, who flies lower than the bateleer is the African hawk eagle. Hello children, you're all in pretty thick bush here today. Just amble up to this mom and these two moms. 
Looks like a very young mob. Huh? Same ones we saw with Tara yesterday. Yeah. But the two little ones. Because <coughs> this female is a very young female. That must be her new baby, maybe her first baby. And hello, Mrs. Ellie. Oh, that's that's the coloured girl. I know you, Mrs. Collard. She was one of the first Ellies that I met. And you, little girl, with your skew tusk. Hello. Hello. Wrinkled little baby. Now, Lynn, if you're watching in Canada, otherwise I'm going to take photos. We're trying to establish how many of these collared girls we have, because we seem to think there are two of these collared females that look similar. That would be part of a <laughs> program to monitor elephant movement and elephant habitat utilization uh, in the different seasons. There are a number of individuals that are collared both cows and bulls that we're looking at up there is the actual transmitter Gilly, morning Gilly. How long do the collars work? Um, as far as I know, maybe about two years, Gilly. And sometimes the collars actually are left on. Because it can be sometimes too traumatic to take them off. and they eventually wear off and fall off. Okay, let's see, let's try and get some info on a little snap of these little ones. She's going over to join the rest of a bigger herd on our, our left, deciding instead to go behind us rather than in front of us. A little bit shy, actually. Oh, Nelly. Nelly stood in wet buffalo dung. Thank you, Luck. Huh. A small family in Lov on Spam Road.
I haven't worked with collars since 1997 or 98 and even then I didn't work with them I, work, I kind of assisted with scientists that were working with them and that was colored lion in East Africa and in 97, 98 we didn't have the technology this, the cell phone technology that we have today and a lot, some collars, I know in Kenya, in, up in, uh, near Mount Kenya, when I was in Meru National Park, there was an elephant program, they were trying to monitor the elephants there. They actually had cell phone transmitters in the collars of those elephants. And you could actually, and basically it was a, a, cell, a cell phone and a SIM card so that they could, they could track it through the cell phone signal. So you could theoretically dial up an elephant, you phone up an elephant. Of course, it wouldn't have a phone in it that would make it ring, but I mean, it would, the concept is just so weird. But the only collars that I still remember are the old radio transmitter collars that uh, would have this transceiver, and you'd drive around with a transceiver and a and an antenna and it was a directional antenna and you'd have this very very faint blip blip beep blip, blip you know what i mean kind of beep thing and there was just a subtle subtle change in its intensity or its, its volume and that would tell you which direction it was not very easy nowadays they they satellite tracking collars perhaps and they they uploaded upload information to a satellite and send gps data and of course the other thing is that batteries are different now. In those days I don't think there were lithium ions or whatever batteries are used now. They were nickel cadmium and batteries that didn't last very long. So I don't know about the collars of today. I don't know how long they last. I don't know how long they stay on the animals. I don't know if they're taken off. On elephant it might not be that bad. Who knows? I know that in some cases Scientists would rather leave a collar on an animal for the last few years of its life rather than put it through the stress and possibly kill it by darting it. And it's something that people don't realize is that it's one thing when you're doing research and having, well, let's put it, let me, let me just take a step back here. This kind of research is vital <coughs> for information on how, <coughs> how to manage elephant population better because unfortunately it does have to be managed unfortunately as big as the Kruger National Park is there can only be a finite number of elephants that can sustain themselves within such a large area and with the population getting up at about 15,000 or so <coughs> then the, the National Parks Board have um, It just gives an idea of the areas that they utilize and maybe areas that the park can concentrate on, on overall par uh, park management that includes elephant population management, as big as it is. So, they've gone into thick bush. They seem to be maybe heading down towards Treehouse Dam. So we're going to finish going around Spam Road. We'll get to Treehouse Dam maybe about the same time that they do. I don't get distracted, I shouldn't.
and check Gary Main. I always do when I'm at this particular spot. Just check on the main road to see what animals. There's a daker running up ahead. Wasn't running away from us. It was running. I don't see anything chasing it. Oh, lots of zebra. Lots of zebra have gone south. Hello Linda, welcome to our drive this morning, that is giraffe far in the bush there and there was a kudu far in the bush there. I'm going to stop into the sea and yeah, I want to get to the dam see if the elephants are coming. Um, Linda was asking about a question she asked yesterday when she was saying, she asked a question about hyenas getting lighter in summer and I think when I asked the question, there's a lizard buzzard, just, I think it's a lizard buzzard, just flown into this marula tree. Can you see it up there, sir? First, second, third to the, third branch to the left of this marula. This marula, yeah. first branch, second, thin branch. Oh, okay, got him. I think it's got something in its talons. It does. Yeah, it's just caught something. And is it a lizard buzzard? I don't know, it's got a red eye. It looks like a little sparrowhawk. I can't tell whether it's fur or feathers underneath its feet there. There could be a little shikra, come to think of it. If I could just see the colour of its breast. The dark, there is one diagnostic feature of the shikra is the little dark band at the tip of the tail and the red eye. And then we go into the goshawks. That's probably a shikra. Eurasian See a pretty neat grey tail with a dark band at the end of it and uh, well, the lizard buzzard's got white bands, white barring in the white, not barring but white bands in the tail and perhaps a little bit bigger than that so shikra it is Accipita bardis and some. How do you spell that? Huh? How do you spell that? Shikra. Yeah. S-H-I-K-R-A. Sorry, Linda, get there in a sec. A couple of black 
or rather magpie strikes, whole family of them sitting around here. They were shouting at it earlier. And I wonder if we could maybe move, maybe see the front of it. We see the front of it. They can try and intimidate it. They might intimidate it enough that it drops its prey. There are now five of the... Oh, it's gone. It's a mouse. I saw the long tail of the mouse as it flew away. Did you see that? Mm. It's a small rodent. Well done, little bird. Got yourself some breakfast. I suppose pound for pound, it's like Karula taking down an impala. No, that's no, no, not quite. A small warthog, not a small warthog. A daker, there we go. There's a, a stienbuck. There we go. Pound for pound, Karula with a stienbuck. Here's one of the Ellies. Two of the Ellies, three of the Ellies, some more of the Ellies. Edging right into the thick of them. Half a dozen on our left, a couple on our right, and as I enter this, as we go down here, we sort of right in the middle of this herd of alleys. There's a little boy next to me here on the right. Okay, I'll stop because he shook his head at me. Doesn't mean we get a good view of anybody. She's sniffing at us. Uh, I can try again. Just move. Uh, uh, elephants will move. Interview. They're all feeding. Seems to be generally moving east. This herd looks like quite a large group. So it's a number of family units that have come together. Different females and their and their off and their immediate families, their offspring, their daughters. I mean, it's a couple, probably a few matriarchs that are joining together. Matriarchs that are in themselves related, but they each run their own family groups. And they come together from time to time. And maybe once upon a time, these matriarchs, each matriarch of these groups was a child in a family group that used to play together. Guy's using his tusk there. Trying to break it in a way that it strips the box. Now he's using his trunk more than anything else to try and strip the bark. There we go. He broke it, now eat it. You, you dropped it. Now just pulling the bark off. Linda, sorry, Linda was saying not meaning lighter in color, but lighter in, in density. And what is the point of an animal like a hyena having such a thick coat in such a hot climate? And Linda, it's only really the youngsters that have relatively thick coats. And our animals in this part of the world don't really get much of a different coat density in 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 the different seasons because we don't get very cold. It's only really climates that get covered in snow and get go through such extremes of temperature where animals have developed winter coats versus summer coats. 
And I suppose much like the lion's mane protect him in fighting, I suppose hyenas coat in some ways protect them when they're squabbling over food and with all the bickering and things that goes on. But it is a good question. I don't know why hyenas would have such thick coats. Maybe it helps insulate them against the heat as much as it helps insulate them from the cold. There are a lot of elephants here. What is he trying to do? I should try and move forward a bit. Scratching his chest. Oh, got a nice scratching post there. Well, yeah, the other one broke the branch and chewed the bark off of it. And he's using it as a rubbing post. Thanks, Dr. Rita. Also saying probably a shikra. He's trying to get to roots here, this boy. They were trying to push. What happened was they must have been trying to push that bush willow over to lift it to get to the roots. And he's been fighting with the stump that remained. Not being able to get to the roots. And his <laughs> zebra, small zebra wood scratching him in a delicate place. <coughs> okay, I think we should go to the dam and wait for them there and try and make our way there. Otherwise, they're going to all get to the water and cause there's some right up ahead there already. Maybe get there and wait for them. <coughs> Relax, little boy. Sorry to move you on from your toy. Bushwillow, Cumbretons. 
Sorry, Mrs. Ellie, you've got quite a funny ear. Okay. Alright, we can't go much further. She doesn't want me to go much further. I'm just gonna... She's also got backed up with her calf right against the bush, so I just want to get a little forward. There, she's opening it up, pushing herself through. Um, quite an interesting collapsed right ear. At the top, her cartilage is folded back a little bit more than usual. Should be quite a distinctive feature of hers. Looks like they've been stressed by a vehicle recently because they... Just the way she behaved. Hello Gilly, welcome. Gilly's asking, how come they don't puncture their intestines with these sharp sticks and things that they eat? Well Gilly, they've evolved over millions of years to be able to handle it. As, because plants probably haven't always been so spiny. The spines and things on plants have been a, 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 an adaptation to the diversity of life that feeds on the plants. Hello, little one. Um, they chew them up, they crush them enough with those heavy molars it is and that's why they've, they've developed such heavy thick mo sets of molar teeth is to be able to crush those twigs and sticks to a certain extent and to a certain thickness and of course that then of their gut has developed very thick lining it's not like suddenly they have to eat sharp things and they've been eating soft things all their lives then it would be a different story but the very fact that they they have been part of this and they've they have developed along with their environment so maybe a long time ago before the african elephant became an african elephant when there were still things like gomphotheres and 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 mastodons and mammoths in fact even before them oh hello big man you're in must as well you are huge, wow. boy. Sure there's a big sure. bull that's just come along look at his yeah it's very very strong smelling Sure, look at that, and, he's, and that young flick, the tiny little female, he's testing her urine already, she's very young, moving right on, oh, he just subtly, subtly tested her urine because she's dribbling too, but he moved on, she's still too young, not interested in such a youngster, look up. but he's towering over everybody. I didn't see him climbing. No, I didn't, I didn't even know. <laughs> Next second, I saw that huge thing in the corner of my right hand. Uh, look at him, he towers over everybody. He's like a basketball player. Yeah. And there are a few females coming after him too. So much for trying to get to the dam ahead of everybody, but they're all on the road, so I can't get past them. But, Gilly, I don't know if I can explain it better, but other than... Um, ancestor of elephants might have fed on soft vegetation, and as nature moved on and things changed and adapted to change we've got what we have now so it's, it's not like they just suddenly have to adapt to to these things gosh look at that bull looks nice let's get a whole procession of elephants in front of us actually maybe not quite the best place to stop but he's 
kind of ignored everybody. He's just making a beeline for the water. <coughs> We've got to have at least 30, maybe more elephants around us at the moment. Okay. Wow. And they spread out over and I'm dragging a stick. They spread out over a long air, wide area, at least a few hundred yards worth. Okay now here's this female again who's gonna think I'm doing something to her and she's gonna take it personally now. I just wanna get past madam because I want to see that big man when he gets to the dam. Yeah. He's just marched straight on towards the dam. And he's got a huge following. Sorry, Mrs. Ellie. Oh, she's okay, she's not too worried about me. Slum and Glove slowly making their way towards Trias Dam and can I get an update please? Everyone's moving fast all of a sudden. It partly maybe got to do with me but I think partly because they're all deciding to rush to the dam quickly. Okay, let's go and see. <laughs> that's not a trumpet, that's just blowing air through your trunk. Uh, well, the rest of the herd is going to be a while coming to the dam, but he's almost there already. Follow the smell. His temporal glands are weeping, his penis is dribbling urine. Yo! Oh, we missed it. It's just taken out a huge knob thorn. On his way down to the water. Yeah. He's not getting nice, not going to the water, nice. Nice too. He just... Oh, he's pretty feeding on some of the flowers. Oh, quite a pretty sky. It's opening up above us, but there's still quite thick grey in the east. We're not going to get sun for a little bit still. Maybe another half hour or so, and then we'll get some sunshine. we could watch him from here for now. Beautiful reflection.
Cheryl, I'm not sure if I understand what you mean. Why does Ellie have two parts to the tail? You mean hair on the top and hair on the bottom, perhaps? Um, And look at that, on his own, he doesn't look like a very impressive elephant, but when he's with all those females and youngsters, he towers above them. The tails on an elephant's hair, no, let's do it another way around. The hair on an elephant's tail, it's a better way of putting it, act almost like a, like whiskers. I mean, yeah, they, they double as a nice fly swish if they've got decent hair on their tail, but essentially it's almost like whiskers on, whiskers on an animal in that they're used as a sensory organ. They're used to help guide an elephant when it's reversing, when it's walking back for, backwards. When, when females have got youngsters, they keep track of their youngsters by feeling behind them with their tails. Um, why it's paddle shaped like that and it's got hairs on the outside and the inside, Possibly because those are where the most sensitive touch receptors are on the inside so that it can feel things close to its own leg. And both inside and out. Don't know. I'm just thinking of things. Hello, Gail. This is kind of answering your question, Gail. Wanting to know if we've ever encountered an elephant in must and do they show aggression? They do sometimes. This elephant bull is in full must at the moment and he walked past us without a, without even acknowledging us. It's different bulls, different things. Um, I wish we had some sunlight. It would be nice if the sun would just get above that cloud. It's about to. I can just see it popping its head through little breaks in the top of the cloud. But there are elephants that can show aggression. I have had that in the past. <coughs> it's not a comfortable thing being in must. Um, with the swelling of the temporal glands, it does evidently have some of uh, uh, it, it, it puts pressure on the on the teeth, on the base of the tusks. He's just pushed a knob thorn for absolutely no reason whatsoever. A knob thorn not much smaller than the one that he's that's just to the left of our uh, left of him. Teddy. Do elephants have favorite trees or bark and do they inflict much damage on the b bigger trees? Well, yes, they do favor certain species and they do favor certain the bark of certain species, but it also largely depends on what time of the year and what habitat they're in. Because at the moment they're in this habitat, they'll be feeding on certain things here and maybe in two weeks' time, three weeks' time, they're in a different habitat with a different composition of trees, so they'll be feeding on other other trees there.
And I wouldn't really, I mean, yes, some people call it damage, and I suppose in, in, in some circumstances one could see it as damage <coughs> when one considers the large populations of elephants that move around and um, can put pressure on an area. The thing is that if we weren't here as humans and we didn't look at it the way we humans look at things because we we humans don't tend to see things the way nature sees things or the way nature does things we see it all from from our point of view of aesthetics and 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 um we have this judgment of what is not nice and what isn't nice and what's pretty what's not pretty what's not ugly and all of those concepts don't apply to in in nature because nature makes things in its na nature makes things for its own reasons and that's got nothing to do with pleasing us humans so to a large extent when elephants are feeding they're actually engaging in a constructive process it's not a destructive process because without the way without the the consequences to elephant feeding you don't get a regeneration of nutrients in the soil um, by branches being 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 broken off trees and lying on the ground or trees being pushed over and lying on the ground allowing a succession of plants to take place and allowing oh wow you see what he's doing now is he's blowing water onto the back of his mouth probably onto the base of his tusks not so much the back of his mouth but in his mouth probably got a bit of toothache from being in must But yes, sometimes when we when I see a tree like a big marula tree that has been ring barked and then dies, it is kind of sad, in a way. Or a, no, like the knob thorn that he pushed over. Kind of sad that he would that that. Well, that tree might still live. There comes a bit of sunshine now, very, very faint, still coming through cloud, but... <coughs> Some zebra coming down to drink. He's just looking over to see some zebra. His eye caught them the same as time as Martin. And we're going to see whether he's going to. The zebra have actually stopped now. And he's turning to face him. I don't know. He might get irritable with them. He is in must. He is standing with attitude. And the zebras see him and they're still making their way to the water. We're going to sit here for a while because we've got zebra coming to drink and then I'm sure that herd is going to come and drink. Evil dog. I'm sure evil dog is dug.
Grace Nugget. He's about to fill up the dam. No, no urine. Doug wants to know what is exactly, what is the fluid leaking from his temporal glands? I actually don't know what the exact fluid is, Doug. It's, a, it's, it's testosterone. Oh, look at this. He's going for that big knob thorn now. Sure. But he's just, you see, he's pushing because of the pressure on his tusks. He's, he's trying to relieve some of, probably some of the, the, the I don't know whether it's pain or pressure or it's just must be like if you get a swollen gum or something there he's gonna go for that other acacia now it's a little bit smaller but I don't, I don't know it's exact comp composition Fortunately, it looks like he's not going to push it over. Or is he? No, I don't know yet. Looks like he's getting close to. Take a branch or first. Some of the first females and calves are coming into view now as well. Okay, look at this boy. Sure. And that's one less knob thorn at Treehouse Dam. Yeah, one less knob thorn at Treehouse Dam. That was a nice knob thorn as well. And we might have one mouthful of flowers. It's got an M shape out of his right ear. No, a notch, M shaped notch. I'm going to eat some of the flowers and maybe a few new leaves coming out. Oh, here come the girls. The girls and the babies. Now, they will benefit too because they'll eventually, I'm sure, come past that tree and some of the youngsters will get to some parts of a knob thorn that they won't ever be able to get hold of unless it's pushed over by an adult. Zebra coming to drink, elephant coming to drink. I could, Seb, before they get here... Mm. Let's just turn around and face the dam and make it a little bit better. I want to also be able to see those zebra though. And we've got a beautiful waterhole scene happening here now. And the light is just becoming perfect. The sun is rising above that dark cloud, but there's still a little bit of cloud, so the sun is being filtered a little bit. Uh, we can see him, we can see the zebra, we can see... The mums and babies coming to drink. Sit back and relax and enjoy the show.
proteins, lipids, phenols, and cresols, uh, phenosol. Thanks, Tara, just from Wikipedia. Temper, what's it called? Temperin. Uh, came from Nancy. Temperin. Thank you, Nancy. Message from Nancy. Also, wanting to know the roads we're on from time to time. Sure, Nancy. At the moment we're at Trias Dam. Elephants are hesitating on the other side, maybe because I started up and we'll sit quietly a little bit more and wait a little longer. They will be coming. They're slowly making their way. And also Janet, thank you Janet. Also sent through the same info. I'm taking a few photos of these zebras and we can put it on wire cast. We need to increase our portfolio of little pictures to show in in between drives. It's really beautiful seeing a dazzle of zebras together like that. Just get some more light on them. Come on, son. A little bit of a sore foot, that stallion. Got a mare flirting with him. Sure. 
can look right down his throat. Enjoying the flowers. Mm, here we go. The uh, the gate. This the, the Ellie's are starting to come now. There's this particular gate that they have when they come down to water. They sort of they have this head bobbing, almost like a trot when they. Oh, now they stopped because I said it. And Big Daddy's moving on. No, he's not. He's he's coming to us. Pardon? He's covered with pollen. <laughs> yeah. His head is full of pollen. And flower. Prettied up for the ladies. These elephants are quite cautious. They walk a bit, they come closer, and then they stop. Don't push us off the damn wall. Got the bull quite close. I don't know what to look at now because here they come the whole herd. Oh. All right. Um, need two cameras. We need two cameras. Now we can count them as well. I hope I got enough battery in my camera. Oh, this is fantastic. <coughs> this is going to be this long procession of elephants coming to the dam. But also we're going to see individual family groups. Here's one female to the right. There's one. So this is mostly her family group. And there's another family group coming up. They're moving to the left. There's another family group coming up to the back of the right there. Two. So we've got three family groups here now. Another two coming. And all of them would then constitute a breeding herd. Sorry, Cheryl was asking about the zebra and there was one in the middle. And unfortunately, because of lag and stream and then also the emails lag behind sometimes. Sometimes we don't get emails for a few minutes and then all of a sudden a batch of 10 come in. And then when you're asking a question about a specific animal, sometimes by the time the question comes in that animal is gone. As much as we are live and as much as we try, we, would, we love to just have things as close to real time as possible. Sometimes when it's lagging a bit, it's in, it doesn't work. But evidently there was one, I must look at my photos, Cheryl was saying there was one zebra that was a little bit darker. Was it be the stallion? Not necessarily, but it could have been. So I'm just going to pause now. There's that tuskless female. We've seen some of these elephants before. Tuskless females just up ahead of us coming onto the damn wall. I hope they don't want to come this way. Well, they can. Wow, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 14, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, 9, 30. There are at least 30 elephants coming down to the water now. Susan and Trish in Idaho.
both asking the same question. Okay, I've got to move. Sorry, this female wants to come across and she's... In. I have to, she wants to come. So I'm going to go back a little bit so that she can come along the damn wall. Come, lady. She was just gesturing to me that she wants to be here. Maybe she wants to talk to this old boy. Come, lady. Hello, Mr. Ellie. Okay, that'll give her plenty of space to come and do what she wants to do. There's so many elephants everywhere, I don't know where to look first. Hello, big man. Who's going to meet the girls? So. So. How long was, yes, the question? was how long the elephants stay in must. Well, the older bulls, the older bulls, I think, can stay in must for up to three months, but not full dribbling must like this. I'm not too sure how long that exact period is that they are in full must like this, but the whole must period can last in the older bulls up to three months. A very young one there too. <laughs> long time since we've seen so many elephants just in one shot without obscurity, without being obscured rather by trees and You realize you're just blocking our view there, Mr. Ellie. Like, really blocking the view. One elephant's hiding 20. Yeah, move off the road. Better luck next time. And there's still a few more, probably those young bulls that are coming out of the way out at the back. The teenage boys that lag behind, that are only coming out of the bushes in the background now.
only one little boy that was lagging behind. Probably steering clear of this big old boy. Yes. I can hardly hear you, Tara. The hissing's quite loud. I think I've got it. Linda was asking about a nuchal muscle because they have such a big head. They do. It's not as prominent as, say, with rhino. Um, and their shoulder muscles, the, the muscles above the shoulders help with the weight of the head. And they've got very thick necks too. But yeah, it's not as prominent a nuchal muscle. Where are you going, little girl? Basically what he was doing, he was sort of straightening all the thorns in one the spines of that sickle bush in one direction before breaking it off and chewing it. So the spines don't stick up. We've noticed them do that a lot with the white thorns of the acacias, that they'll stroke the thorns all in one direction so that when they're chewing it, they can actually crush the thorns rather than have the thorns, say, jab into a gap between the two molar sets Yeah, if you talk louder.
Hello, Jane. Will the stay with? Will the stay? Will the bull stay with the breeding herd until he's out of musk? No telling. He could leave them today. He could stay. There might be females coming into estrus. There might be females that are in estrus. Um. He might hang out on the fringes. So, no, not necessarily until he's out of must. He'll stay until he stay. See, it's, a, it's not the right word, stay. He might be with them. Oh, he's eating asparagus now. He might be with them until he can establish whether there's a female to mate with. And if not, then he might go and find another herd. Or he might stay with them because there's a female that might be coming into estrus and he'll stay until she does. Um, there's no telling, really. With such a large breeding group, could be they coming together because there are females coming into estrus and they're going to be courting males. And other males are going to come in and they're not really interested in him because he's quite a big bull but he's not an adult. I mean, he's only in his late 20s, early 30s maybe. He's not an old man. They might want to wait until a bigger, older bull comes along. Better genes. An elephant bull with Levi's instead of Wranglers. In the gene department. Not really nice light on him though. Nice and close to take close ups. But the light is such a hazy sun. Okay. Shall we say goodbye to him for now? The only thing we can do really is maybe keep track of them and maybe later this afternoon we might see them again and then he might be with them still or maybe not. Our biggest problem is that a group of elephants like this will move over such a large area and we don't have that kind of a terrain or rather that opportunity to cover as much ground as they do to be able to keep watching them all the time. And that's been my biggest problem with, with anywhere that I've lived in nature, anything that I've observed the kind of way I learn about nature is, is mostly through observing and being with them. But I never get to follow individuals all their lives or for long periods of time. Because things like elephant move over such large distances, it's very hard to keep track of the same individuals. So I might see a herd like this with a bull like this on a day like today, and I might not see any of them again for a year. So I don't know how long he would spend with her or them I know what a book might say, well actually I don't know what a book might say, but I know that a book might say one thing and that might hold for, say, one elephant on one day. Not necessarily it means that all elephants do what, it, what the book does, rather what the book says it does. Behavior is, that is what it is about behavior. There's, there's no set of rules. Or well, there are no set rules. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm just looking across the, the damn wall now. It's, didn't see it earlier, but that jasmine's in flower. The tree where the weavers build their nests, the jasmine is this tree here. The, just the top of that little bush. Some jasmine flowers. From a creeper known as jasminum. The light's really bad today. Not right at the top, but in the green part. A little bit lower. There you can see some of those white flowers. It's on the top of the, the leaf. The, the green part is more the knobthorn's leaves. The white are the creeper, the jasmine creeper that's there. So, young man, can I start up my car without disturbing you eating? Now he's like eating buffalo. No, he's still on the, the sickle bush. Right. Even in must, you see, even in must, he's not really concerned about us much. Okay, well now that he's moved off, we can go and have a quick close-up. My flower for the day, for the ladies. 
Bye bye, Monsieur Elephant. Oh, such a strong smell. Jane in Long Island, and I can't even see them because the sky is too light. Maybe it's afternoon sunshine we'll try and find, or well, there must be other jasmines, but that's looking into a white sky. It's just gonna Long Island. Was it Long Island, Jane? Well, we're not too close to an elephant in Muth. John, I don't know if you noticed, but we were parked there, the elephant came close to us. Um, I don't think I was too close. He was close. The camera does make him look a lot closer, but he was close. I mean, he was a few feet off of the front fender. But, you see, he came close to me. I didn't go close to him. And he's quite relaxed. And not all elephants in musts are... aggressive elephants or bad ele or elephants that are irrita irritable now Sally in New York was asking the other day okay, this, this is about a 30 year old zebra wood or maybe even older it's just been I don't know if Sally is watching. Very, very hard and sharp spines. This has got one of the strongest spines of all. In fact, probably most of our punctures last year were a result of zebra wood. But this was a zebra wood. But Sally was asking, I don't know if it, this is the tree, Sally, saying that they smell, but they don't. He had big bulls on to another big knob thorn that he's just pushed and it's just got a lovely fresh green smell you know there's no bad smell I don't know I still don't know what Sally was talking about when she was talking about the smell of the zebra wood being cut or broken Let's get it out of the road before it causes punctures He's just pushed another knob thorn and carried on walking right on by. Another big zebra wood taken out there. I'm in love now, heading east from Trias Dam. And is there an update besides Skangpan? More zebra wood. A few minutes ago they were feeding more on the bush willow, now they're feeding a lot on zebra wood. So 
So it often depends on what the dominant tree is, where they're feeding. That determines what they'll be eating. So there was a cheetah scene this morning up on Bifflezook. And the airstrip might come this way with a bit of luck. I'll have to check in pile of planes later. Sandy patch. Okay, shall we leave these pachyderms and go and find something else perhaps? I could sit with them. I, mean, I could just follow them all day. A big herd like this. But they've spread out now and they've spread out over quite a large area. Excuse me, little starling. And all moving off into the bush to browse. So let's go and find other things that are happening in springtime. It's really looking beautiful. Little green shoots and little leaves coming out everywhere. Okay, Tara. Give it to me. About the nuchal muscle. No, I think I kind of covered that, Linda, didn't I? It's not as prominent as Rhino, but the... Bye bye, children. No, I couldn't get. I, I got the must part, but what about the end of the trunk? Sorry. You know the way the radio hisses. The divider. Could you discuss? I love it. Alan's, you know it's Alan's question. Could you discuss? I'm not too sure. Talking about the two fingers, the, the Alan, the, the divider. I don't understand that. Elephant's trunk. Alan is asking about the divider. I don't know what he means, whether he's talking about the septum, the, 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 you know, all mammals and nose, we've got, we, we, we talk, let's just get through this bit. Elephants everywhere. There's a, uh, actually I wish I could have seen it at the dam and I've only just noticed it now. But there are a number of elephants in this herd who've got a tusk that curls in towards the trunk. It must be a gene for this whole family that they carry. Okay, so Alan was saying could I discuss the must issue, what is it? And also wanting to know about the divide and the end of the trunk. Now, Leaving the Kulushambian Dwarf on Weaver's Nest, between Weaver's Nest and Triaz Dam. Open lock. Now. So, let's see, where do we start? Must. For those of you who haven't heard of it, it is spelled M-U-S-T-H. Not M-U-S-K, as in musk, as in musk ox or musk produced by the glands of some animals. This is must. It is a period of heightened or, 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 or increased testosterone levels. It's the breeding period for male elephants. And when their testosterone levels increase, they become slightly more or easily agitated. Testosterone levels evidently can get to 50 times their normal levels when they're in must. 
and they go through hormonal and, 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 and physical changes that make them uncomfortable and can make them a little bit irrita irritable. Elephants in must are known to have caused damage in India, for example, and Sri Lanka and other countries, Thailand perhaps, where elephants are... Elephants work with humans and humans have elephants in their family, well, where elephants are used as beasts of burden. In some cases they're beasts of burden, in some case, cases they are revered and they're treated very well, but nonetheless when elephants are in must, Asian elephant bulls, they actually, they have to be, not have to be, they are chained up and they're, they, don't, they, they get off work because well, they, they can cause havoc. Any time you hear of Asian elephants running amok, it's 99% of the time it's elephant bulls in must. And it's just bulls that are just, they have enough of that, that life of servitude. Oh, I've got an itchy nose because I want to sneeze and the sun's not bright enough to make me sneeze. But Alan was also asking about, you know, all mammals have got a nose that is divided into two nostrils, it's divided by, what is it called, the septum, the septum, the cartilage. And well, an elephant's nose is no different, although it is so much elongated, more elongated than other noses. And the muscles of the trunk give it two little like finger, fingertips at the end of the trunk that allow it to manipulate things and allow it to pick things up. Asian elephants only got the one finger and African elephants have two. I don't know if that's what you meant, Alan. Okay, you're breaking up, Tara. investigate tree house, uh, twin dams now. So, three, two, three out of five. Uh, only got the last bit of that one. What the, okay, Joan. Joan wants to know the difference in intelligence between African and Asian elephants. Good question, Joan. I don't know if I could answer it. I would say that there is a difference in the intelligence, yes, because they're different animals. But whether one is more intelligent than the other, that's a different story. Um, whether their cognitive abilities or their rationalizing abilities or their... I don't know. I don't know how one would measure it. And whether the fact that Asian elephants having been domesticated, have learnt different skills as a result of having such a close relationship with humans. I mean, if you can think about it, if dogs, domestic dogs, have enhanced their ability to communicate because of their association with humans, then surely something as intelligent as an elephant should be able to enhance its abilities to do things being in such close proximity to humans. Giraffe way across the drainage line. But I don't know how I would be able to quantify it. I don't know how I would be able to, well not I, me personally, I don't know how it would be able to be measured. You'd have to give them each a quiz. 
You have an Asian elephant and an African elephant. And not exactly a verbal quiz, but you'd have to give them a variety of tasks and things and see whether their problem-solving skills differ. Whether they will, when the different things to make them work together, I don't know. But then you'd have to do that with many different sets of elephants because you wouldn't be able to draw any conclusions just from one individual of each animal. I sometimes feel guilty when I call elephants animals because they're not. They're elephants. They are these huge peaceful souls. So we're now on Gauri Main, we're heading east, we're going through the dip of the Mulwati River causeway that was flowing nice and strongly in summer, a few after some of the good rains. to Ledwood Road, head off the main road. We might catch up with those giraffes that I saw from Twin Dams if we're coming up this way. Hyena trap. they are. I think these two boys were sparring. Is that one, that darkish youngster there? I think they were sparring, these two young boys, because the way that one is standing, he's sort of standing, he's got that open-legged stance, so he's moving now. He was standing open-legged, he's got no tail too. He lost the tip of his tail. And do know the giraffe. So I think those two little boys were playing. Over to Scottsdale in Arizona. Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay, back to elephant questions still from on the subject of the elephants. I want to see we can maybe those bulls, those little boys, there's a female here. Those little boys are gonna come out into the open. Maybe they'll spar again.
Was that Anne? Sorry, Anne in Scottsdale. <laughs> Suzanne. Not Anne, but Suzanne. Susan was asking when it comes to the mating, is it the male or the females that do the choosing? Well, actually, it's the matriarch. But sometimes the males can force themselves on females. Rape is a known phenomenon in elephant society. And it is and it is an, an a reality because female elephants pretty much control to some degree the mating and young bulls are kept at bay the females try to keep them at bay until the larger bulls come along and generally it's been thought that the matriarch will decide who will come in and let and, and, and mate with her cows, her daughters and, I, a, lot of, and a lot of elephant behavior has been f filmed like this and in, you think of the elephants of Amboseli in Kenya, Cynthia Moss a lot in Kenya and they've been watched for decades, so they know every, almost every individual there, and they they follow the family histories, and they watch the males come in and the females. And that's where a lot of this comes from. But I don't know, you know, when you talk, when you've got a habitat and an environment like Amboseli, and then you look at a place like Kruger, you've got two completely different dynamics that are going on. And, for example, the other day, not the other day, a few weeks ago, I can't remember when it was, but we were with a herd of Ellie's on Central Road and there was a male that was chasing a young female and I, I believe that if the terrain was more open and the, the herd was a little bit more tightly spaced, I think the matriarch probably wouldn't have allowed that to happen, but I think he managed to chase her off into some bu behind some bushes and away from the herd, but he was only surrounded by younger bulls and he managed to mount and mate with I don't know if he managed to mate with her, but he managed to mount a very young female who was half his size. But theoretically, it's supposed to be the matriarchs that choose the bulls, which bulls come in and mate with the females. And he has a big male giraffe. Well, that's the young male we're watching now. There's a big male watching him maybe his father even try and move a little bit forward but these giraffe aren't in the best of habitat to watch being quite thick like this uh, I'm not going to get a good view of him tall, very handsome boy, that adult bull in his prime. You can see a little bit of calcification happening on his, on his forehead or just above his eyes, on his, and also on the back of the head. seem to be a, quite a few giraffe in there. Well, we'll just have to find others. The bush is very thick. They spread out all the way from here on Leadwood Road to Twin Dams. We're directly east of Twin Dams on Leadwood Road, if you're looking at the map. And from this road to the dam is a group of giraffe. Every now and then you just see a head moving through the bushes, but nothing clear. Hello, 
Deborah in Tennessee. You never heard us talk about the honey guide. You must have missed those drives. But it has been some time since we've seen and heard a honey guide, Deborah. And maybe now, now's a good time. Keep my ears open for that very distinctive call of the greater honey guide. Now the honey guide is a bird who's got a very appropriate name. Indicator, indicator, I think it is. Mm, a scientific name. And it does exactly what its name suggests. It indicates, it guides you to honey. Well, the normal territorial call of the honey guide is Victor, Victor. <coughs> sort of like that. But it has another another sound actually, the honey guide. It makes like a rattling sound. Almost like rattling a box of matches lengthways. Very fast. And it has a habit of flying right in front of you, hopping into a tree almost at, at eye level, within a few feet of your face and making this noise and, and, and chittering loudly. And if you don't follow it, it insists, it gets very insistent. It comes and sits in a tree and it gets very agitated until you start following it and then starts flying from tree to tree. And if it sees you following it, it'll fly from tree to tree and it'll take you to a beehive. But then you've got to get the beehive open and then you've got to get some honeycomb out and you've got to give it to the bird because the bird doesn't do all of that for nothing. It demands payment. And there are consequences. And retri retribution. If payment isn't received. Sometimes, well the story goes that if you don't give the honey guard some honey, the next time you follow it, it'll take you to a predator. They just missed a, a flock of green woodipers flying across our bow and a bachelor sitting in the dead tree that they normally sit in and it looks like buffalo to the right yes a herd of buffalo but the honey guide has a very close relationship with the honey badger and the two of them work together and the honey badger knows that the honey guide has to leave it leave some honey, well, some honeycomb, so they can get to the grubs, the lava. See if we can get around this termite mound to these buffalo. Looks like it could just be a group of bulls. Hello boys. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, maybe fifteen odd bulls. Thirteen or fifteen. A couple of really big ones. And they might have just come across from the south. Maybe these are bulls we don't know. Maybe they're bulls we do. This one in front of us got a very narrow twist to his horns. It'd be interesting if we could get any of them to lift their heads to see whether our pink-nosed bull is with them. And we know it's maybe the group from Treehouse. Rebecca's Road Treehouse group.
anyone's interested, there's about a dozen Dugga boys on Leadwood Road. Help them. They're doing three things. They're cropping grasses by eating them. They're flattening grasses by walking in the manner that they walk. And they leave behind little pockets of fertilizer as they go along. So perhaps one of the most vital elements of this kind of environment is a herd of buffalo to be able to open it up and get the dry grasses flattened and opened up so that when the time comes there's space and light for the new grasses to come through. Oh, you're going to get into trouble. One bull was just pushing his luck with another bull. And I think that other bull is going to turn around and give him a Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, maybe even more, could even be twenty of them. about 15 tons of buffalo making its way towards us. Quite impressive, actually. You can see the different colors on the bosses from rubbing their horns on trees and different shapes to the horns, different densities, the different densities of the boss. In some places it looks like it was poured on as liquid and it's solidified.
they're a lot more peaceful than a big breeding herd where there's a lot of pushing and shoving and bickering and and sparring i suppose these boys can get a little bit active at times it's a time of day when they're taking in a lot of food so that later on when it if and when i don't know it's starting to get overcast again but during the heat of the day they can then go and lie in a mud pool or lie in the shade somewhere and then chew the cud so it's a perfect time of the way to harvest the food to actually sell select their food and because they're so busy eating I suppose there's not much interaction between individuals but even so in a breeding herd with all the females and the youngsters you will get a lot more other activity going on a couple of really big bulls yeah okay Randy in Iowa, the damage to the buffalo horns, age, fighting, or both. Randy, I'm not too sure which damage you're talking about. I mean, if you look at this one that we've got now, it looks like his left horn is a little bit different to the right horn. What was that noise? Sounded like two horns clashing. Um, there's a bunch of things. Hey, that's, that's actually genetic. His left horn is lower than the right almost like old seesaw was um i don't know what damage you mean there's there are like this one here for example his right horn is chipped and broken a little bit on the tip that's from fighting no Sir, one this one no this one yeah closer to me that right horn you can see the tip of it um other right his right <laughs> there you can see it's chipped that can only happen from fighting some of them break the tip of their horns from fighting their horns can get locked and when you think about it you've got eight nine hundred kilograms of animal and extremely strong muscles around that neck and shoulder muscle is is you is just it's intense i mean look at it He, uh, these are big animals, so when they, their horns are locked and they're pushing and shoving and hitting into each other, there's a lot of weight and muscle behind the twisting and shoving that causes the breaks. On the other hand, there is a lot, if we look at the bus and we look at the, a lot of the texture of the horns, I'm quite sure that the horn borer larvae do tend to get in onto the horns but the reason why we don't see the silk and we don't see the, 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 the result of the moths being there is because they're constantly rubbing their horns. There appear to be channels and, and tunnels from lava that are eating into the horns. And over age, the horns do get thinner instead of thicker, where they twist up. Now, it's possible that is a result of the horn borers that get into the horns while they're still alive. But then there's a lot of wear and tear as they age. Yeah, now there's a bit of posturing. Stay off of my grass. This one over here, I was just shouting at that one over there. Get off my patch of grass. Quite interesting. Quite chilly. <laughs> Quite shy, <laughs> the one just behind us. Yeah, I found a place here. 
down there, Tampa. Here's the Sanguinea, the first one. See a little flower there, see? Yeah. Maybe the grass is in the way. Been waiting for that. If I'm not mistaken, it's called Sanguinea. Because it's got a blood red bulb. And they normally are the first flowers to come. I mean, we've seen trees blooming and things and flowers on trees and stuff. But in terms of the actual sort of ground flowers, it's the first one I'm seeing coming out and I've been waiting for them. And I think last year we actually saw them a little bit earlier. Now, let me get two scientific names. I don't know what its name is in English. Sarcostema. What is it called again? Oh. You know, when you don't see things for a year, you forget. Flowers of the half out. Never gonna get them there. Um, there was also another plant that I saw coming up yesterday. Um, related to the Xanthodesia. That's the same as the Arum lily family and it is the equivalent of our Arum lily of the bush. Although it doesn't have the beautiful white Arum. And... Or maybe it's the species name Sanguinea. It must be the species name, Sanguinea. Um, gosh, to find it now, again. I uh, know Sharon might know, but I don't know if Sharon has got a computer yet. And I don't know if... Uh, the damage Randy was talking about is across the top of the horns. There's not really that much damage on the top of the horns, but there is evidence that the horn borers get into them and they rub them and get somehow manage to get them under control. I'm just going to have to try and find it again. How many petals did it have? But it's been it's been a year since I've seen this flower, so I hope you excuse me for getting the name. Petals aren't even open yet. We'll be seeing a lot of them, especially in the fire break where the area's been burnt. And we'll get a close up look at them. I took very close up photos last year. Oh, sure. Clutch is acting up again. Um, trying to think what it was. I'll, I'll look it up. I remember having the same problem every year with some flowers. Some flowers, I remember, just like that. We have that H E U C H R. Anyways, no, I'm not sure. Coral bells. There would be a number of things called with the species name Sanguinea. 
because it refers it comes from the word sanguine which is blood which refers to the color so I know there's a senna sanguiana sanguinea senna sanguiana sanguinea because it has blood red uh, the senna has branchlets that are, are red this one why sanguinea came to mind but I, why I was thinking it was the genus that was sanguiana or sanguinea Okay, I'm going back towards Gary Main quickly, just briefly, quickly. Just look over the top. Big elephant tracks being driven over by cars. There was another elephant bull. We've actually had a shortage of elephant bulls. We've seen mostly elephant cows and calves of late and the bulls have actually been conspicuous by their absence and this particular bull went north big bull I just wanted to look over this ridge much happening there. There's a big piece of silver. have a problem welcome back everyone I don't know what you missed I don't know how much you missed definitely missed the plant I just showed you so a few minutes ago turning down central road now I'll have to show you the flower the plant either later today or in a few days time it's only just starting to appear above the ground it comes out of a rhizome and it's related to the arum lily it has a leaf very similar to the arum lily there are quite a few of them on that fire break Central Road. Oh, I've got cold tea. Lion. Because the, this is sort of our area that we cover. It's kind of the overlapping home range of several different lion groups but it doesn't form the core of the territory of these groups so the lion don't live, don't kind of occupy this all the time they come through here when they're exploring the edges of their home ranges and that's what makes the hyenas so successful they don't have competition or well, the competition from leopards is not that great they are able to steal a lot of kills from the leopard because the leopard population is quite dense and our leopards tend to get a little bit lazy sometimes in terms of pushing, putting their, tre treeing their kills, putting their kills into trees and the leopard don't really argue with the hyena if the hyena want to kill and that's why we have a good clan here
sleeping. Back again, seems I lost you again. Not signal this time is internet dropping. Ah, uh, he has a black monkey. and we've got an inverter problem. That's after a whole night of charging. We're gonna soon have to switch off as soon as we hear the beeping. In fact, we should now. I just wanna get through the next up. are not there today. Gang. Stop here and we'll watch them approach because they're not going to let us get close. <laughs> Look at that Gordy playing with one of the kids. What's he doing to her? Evil and I think. <laughs> oh, see, it's windy. Yes, they're a little bit skittish. So when in doubt, just sit it out. Not too sure. He won't lead the rest of the troop. Looks like he seems to have taken charge. That was quite a jump. There must be LB on the left. On her own. No, maybe not. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, well, she's going to move off anyway into the grasses, so we're going to lose sight of them. And you're going to lose sight of us. I'm going to say goodbye. I don't want to push it. We don't have much time between our morning and afternoon drives. And if we've got a problem just from the whole night of charging. So, we're going to say goodbye to you. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for all the questions this morning. Bye-bye to the Gauri gang. Hope you enjoyed the elephants as much as we did. And those zebra. The zebra drinking the elephants. It was really nice. My name is Mark. Seb on camera, Tara back in FC, and uh, oh, this is Juma Game Reserve. I'll see you later. Bye, everyone.
everybody, this is Tara back in Final Control, and unfortunately, uh, with the battery, well, with the inverted beeping, we do have to bring the vehicle back on charge to make sure we get uh, enough battery time or charging time for the afternoon drive. So take care, everybody, wherever you are in the world. And I'm hoping today is going to brighten up a little bit. It looks like it's actually the clouds pulling in a little bit more, the wind is picking up, but uh, keep your fingers crossed, and hopefully you'll have a great drive this afternoon as well. But uh, what a wonderful start to the day with the elephants and the buffalo and the zebra, as Mark said. And uh, certainly some of you enjoying the flowers there too. So take care and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.